In this module, we'll cover the cooling analysis. The goals of this module will be to review the concepts of cooling for injection molds, as well as learn about cooling results and how we can use them. Why? It's important to understand the cooling concepts when you're trying to optimize the cooling within your mold. So, to effectively use a cooling analysis, the correct results also need to be compared to your objectives. Now we'll talk a little bit more about the cooling phase of your injection molding cycle. So, the cooling phase is typically a very large section of the injection molding cycle, as you can see from the image below. In this case of this example, it's almost half your cycle time. The mold cooling efficiency depends on heat transfer effectiveness of the different components, so we need to keep this in mind and analyze this using our cooling analysis. This image quickly illustrates the heat transfer that goes on within a typical injection mold. So your plastic's injecting from the right, as we can see, into the tool. From there, the heat will be transferred from the plastic to the mold wall and into the tool. Hopefully from there, it'll be transferred to the cooling lines and out of your mold. However, there will be some heat transfer that goes on to your platen, which is the big steel plate on your injection molding machine that you're clamping your mold to, as well as some heat transfer to the outer surfaces of the mold. So what determines your cooling performance within your mold? It's typically determined by the rate of heat transfer from the plastic to the cavity wall, the rate of heat transfer through the mold, as well as the rate of heat transfer from the coolant metal interface to the coolant. Heat transfer rate is directly influenced by the material properties of the melt as well as the mold, specifically your specific heat and thermal conductivity. Temperature gradient between the melt and mold wall, and the quality of contact between the plastic and the mold wall. Sometimes the plastic will shrink away from the cavity as it's cooling. It's all stuff to keep in mind. So here we can see the effects of your mold temperature on heat transfer. Typically raising the mold temperature will increase the cooling time for your part. If we take a quick look at this graph, it compares a sample part. It's a simple plate which is 2 millimeters thick and 200 millimeters long. We used a mid-range melt temperature and a one second injection time for each. Here you can see that the general, there is a general trend where increasing the mold temperature will increase your cycle time or your cooling time. However, you can see this can vary between different materials. We have a PA66, a polypropylene, and an ABS. This is because of specific heat and thermal conductivity properties for these materials does vary, so you can expect different results. Our coolant flow rate can also have a significant effect on our heat transfer. Coolant flow rate influences the heat transfer between our mold wall and the coolant running through our tool. Heat transfer typically increases as the flow of a coolant changes from laminar flow to turbulent flow. So what's the difference between laminar and turbulent flow? Well the images below illustrate this. So we have laminar flow on the image in the left and turbulent flow on the image on the right. Turbulence is typically measured by what we call a Reynolds number. We'll talk a little more about that in the next slide. So as we have mentioned in the previous slide, we use the Reynolds number as a measure of turbulence. So, a Reynolds number of 2300 will, tip, will represent the onset of turbulence within water. We like to see flow rates that will achieve a Reynolds number of at least 10,000 or greater. I've outlined the equation that's used to determine Reynolds number in this slide. And as you can see from the different inputs into that equation, there are many variables that can influence our Reynolds number. So, one being the diameter of the cooling channel, the velocity of the coolant, the density of the coolant, as well as the dynamic viscosity of the coolant. So, this Reynolds number can be impacted by not only the size of your channels and the velocity or flow rate, 
but also the type of coolant you're using. So when designing your cooling system, it's important to be able to recognize effective heat extraction when it's occurring. So we can set it, consider it effective when the circuit outlet temperature is within two to three degrees Celsius of the inlet temperature. So we're not seeing a huge temperature rise or a huge temperature drop through that circuit between the inlet and outlet. When this does exist, the placement of your cooling lines is going to really become the controlling factor. We'll cover that a little bit more in the upcoming slides here. This slide quickly illustrates how the location of your cooling lines can affect your heat extraction within the mold. Typically, we want to position our cooling lines so they provide uniform cooling within the tool. This means placing them close to hot spots or far from cold spots within the mold. You see the one on the left, we're not very we're not cooling our mold very uniformly. So, we'll actually most likely have warpage or deflection issues in here or increased cycle time. The one on the right is a little more well thought out using the software. So you can see cooling is a lot more uniform. Therefore, our cycle time will likely be decreased and our overall part quality will increase as well. So in modeling your coolant circuits, you also want to keep the coolant pressure drop requirements within mind. So you want to design the pressure drop of your circuits so they're within the capacity of the coolant supply of your factory. If not, then you're not going to be able to achieve this design when you go into production. Your pressure drop is directly related to the length of your cooling lines, the cooling line diameter, as well as the coolant flow rate. So here's a quick example of some of the effects you can see if there are heat concentrations within your tool. So in box-like structures like this one that we've seen in previous modules, you can see that the inside corner is hot, so the walls will bow inwards. This is going to cause significant problems on parts that need to be assembled or with tight tolerances. If this has a lid or something that needs to go on top of this box, it's likely they're not going to match up, and your quality is going to be poor on this part. So we need to use the cooling analysis to investigate some solutions to try to remove heat from the inside corners of this box. So the cooling analysis extends the capabilities for us to simulate the cooling phase of the injection molding process. This enables our mold designer to blueprint and evaluate cooling circuits so we can not only achieve a uniform cooling for better part quality, but also to reduce cycle time. Now we'll talk a little bit more about coolant inlet temperatures. Your inlet temperature is determined mainly by the desired mold surface temperature that you wish to achieve. This means that you'll normally set it 10 to 20 degrees Celsius lower than the mold surface temperature you're aiming for. This is a general guideline or a good starting point, but your optimum temperature will really depend upon the distance between your cooling lines and the part as well as the thermal conductivity of the mold material. Heat transfer is more efficient when the flow in your cooling channels is Ideally, the flow rate within your cooling channels should be enough to achieve a Reynolds number of what? Heat extraction can be considered effective when the circuit outlet temperature is within what temperature range of the inlet temperature? Pressure drop within your circuits is directly related to which of the following? As a general guideline, your coolant inlet temperature should typically be how much cooler than your mold surface temperature. Now we'll take a closer look at some of the cooling analysis results that you'll receive and how you can use these to better your part design. So the first result we'll take a look at is the circuit pressure. This is really showing you the distribution of pressure along each cooling circuit. So this result, it can not only help you ensure that you're within your factory's capacity, but it can also help you identify any possible flow restrictions within your circuits so you can remove or modify them if possible. 
Just keep in mind that this does, this does not take into account the pressure loss due to any external cooling lines that might be running to your thermolator or out of the mold, or any fittings that you may have connecting those exterior lines to your tool. So give yourself some room. You also have access to a circuit coolant temperature result. This is really simply telling you the temperature of the coolant within your circuits. It's shown you for each coolant circuit line and its average over the mold cycle. Again, this is the plot you're gonna look at to make sure that the difference between our inlet and outlet temperatures are within two to three degrees Celsius of one another to make sure that we have optimum heat extraction. You can also use this to see if there are any particular areas of the tool where you're pulling a lot of heat out of and may need to add additional cooling. Now we'll take a closer look at the circuit flow rate plot. This is going to show us the flow rate of the coolant through each individual circuit. How do we know it's acceptable when reviewing this plot? Well, if you recall from previous modules, there are two types of circuits. There's a series circuit and a parallel circuit layout. So for series circuits, the flow is typically going to be the same throughout the circuit, as well as between circuits. So that's something to check for, for series circuits. For parallel circuits, you may have a wide variation in flow rate within your actual circuit. This is because you have many branches and the water will take the path of least resistance. So those outermost branches may have low flow rates that may not allow for efficient heat transfer. This plot will also allow you to double check to see if you can actually achieve these flow rates within your source capacity. So can your factory cooling system actually supply this flow rate? Maybe it can supply the pressure, but not this particular or this high of a flow rate. Now I'll take a few moments to describe the circuit Reynolds number plot in a little more detail. As we had discussed in previous slides, the Reynolds number is a dimensionless number that is a measure of the coolant turbulence. It provides us an indication of the efficiency of heat extraction within our tool. Again, the target Reynolds number should be 10,000. That's what we're aiming to achieve. Values lower than 10,000 indicate low efficiency of heat extraction from the cavity. But you also need to keep in mind that values beyond 10,000 make little difference to the rate of heat extraction. So this means it increases the pumping capacity requirements unnecessarily. We're running maybe at higher flow rates or higher pressures with no gain. Now when reviewing this plot, what do we deem as acceptable and unacceptable? Well, that depends if you run a series circuit versus a parallel circus, circuit. For series circuits, different geometries will have different values. So you may have different, significantly different Reynolds numbers within your circuits versus within baffles or bubblers. So you may need to resize those circuits or resize the bubblers or baffles, depending on what results you're receiving. For parallel circuits, it'll typically be significantly different throughout the circuit. So if you can't achieve a Reynolds number of 10,000, you should at least be, a minimum should be well above a Reynolds number of 4,000. But overall, whether you're looking at a series circuit or a parallel circuit layout, if you're having difficulties achieving your Reynolds number or the optimum Reynolds number of 10,000, there are a few things you could look at. One would be to consider changing your coolant flow rate. You could consider changing the circuit layout. Or you could even change the coolant if this is an option for you. Cooling analysis also gives you a cooling quality plot. This displays where heat tends to stay in a location due to the shape and thickness of the part in that region. Some of the assumptions you should be aware of are that the part is assumed to be in the center of a block of metal. There are no cooling circuits and there is a defined cycle time. So when we're taking a look at this, the green areas have an efficient amount of cooling. Yellow are areas where cooling could be improved. Red are areas of 
poor cooling, which need to be investigated further so we can improve upon them or focus additional cooling in those areas. We'll take a look at the cooling time variance plot as well. This shows the deviation in freeze time of any location to the average freeze time of the part. Red is positive, so this represents areas that take longer to freeze than the average time of the part. Blue are negative, and this represents areas which freeze quicker than the average part. This is really dominated by part thickness, so thick areas will typically have a higher freeze time variance. So, if you have issues with higher freeze time variances, some things you might want to consider would be modifying the part thickness in that area if possible. If not, then you really need to add or focus additional cooling in those areas to reduce that variance in your cooling layout design. The temperature part plot. This is going to show us the average plastic mold interface temperature during the cycle. So it's basically telling us our mold surface temperature. The smaller the range, typically the better. So if you're dealing with semi-crystalline or crystalline materials, really you want to keep that under 5 degrees Celsius. If you're dealing with amorphous materials, you can typically get away with that range being under 10 degrees Celsius. And what I mean by the range is if we're taking a look at our scale. So the min and max values on that scale would define the range. If your tolerances are difficult to achieve, we may want to focus really on minimizing hot and cold spots. Keep an eye on inside corners, as we mentioned before. Consider redesigning the cooling layout. Maybe even adding baffles or bubblers in the example like you see on the right to get additional cooling within those deep draws or deep pockets in the part. Temperature variance plot. This is going to highlight areas where the surface temperature is different than the average. So blue is negative, represents areas that are colder than the average. Red is positive, areas hotter than the average. This is really going to be influenced by your part geometry as well as local thicknesses. So what's acceptable and unacceptable when looking at this plot? So much like the previous slide where we mentioned we want to focus on that range. So the smaller the absolute value of this range, the better. Again, that would be 5 degrees Celsius is optimum, especially for crystalline or semi-crystalline materials. If you run an amorphous material, you typically get away with keeping the range under 10 degrees Celsius. Most of the time, these tolerances may be difficult to achieve. If they are, then you may need to consider redesigning your cooling layout, adding bubblers, or adding baffles into deep areas, such as you see in the image on the right. Now we'll take a look at our final result that you'll get when running a cooling analysis, and that's the time to reach your ejection temperature for the part. This is the time required for each area of the part to cool down to the ejection temperature of the material that you have specified. This is measured from the start of the cycle. So when reviewing this plot and trying to determine what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, you're really looking for uniformity. The time to reach ejection temperature should be uniform across your part or as uniform as possible. But there are many cases where it will not be uniform and that's typically due to wall thicknesses not being the same or your waterline layout not quite being optimal yet. So we can correct this by thinning areas of the part that are thicker. We can get more cooling in areas that are difficult called to cool by adding additional water lines maybe. Or we could change our water line position. So here's a simple example of how the cooling analysis can help you better your part design. So our original part design here lacked adequate cooling in that deep draw within the part. So you can see we have significantly poor quality in that region. So what we did was we redesigned our cooling line layout so that we can focus additional cooling down in that pocket. Now you can see the cooling quality or the quality of the part has significantly increased. Therefore, we will have a better quality part in the end. 
when evaluating the temperature part plot for crystalline materials, the temperature range on your scale should be. The circuit pressure plot takes external hoses and fittings into account for the pressure loss calculations, true or false. The temperature variance plot is mainly influenced by the time to reach ejection temperature plot is derived using the now we'll take a close look at how cooling can affect our pack and warp results. So we've taken a look at quite a few analysis sequences. So we will compare a few of them on one slide just to summarize. We have our cooling quality analysis, which will display where heat tends to stay in a location due to its shape and thickness. Remember, for this analysis sequence, we don't have any cooling circuits modeled yet. We have a fill, pack, and warp analysis. This, on its own, is considering or assuming ideal cooling within our part, which is not what's happening in reality. So, if we add a cool to our fill, pack, and warp analysis, this is truly considering the effects of the cooling system on our fill, pack, and warp results. So this is really a more, much more comprehensive look at what's happening in real life. Now we'll compare our cooling quality results. If we take a look at the image on the right here, you can see the part in the upper part of this image is where we just ran a cooling quality analysis only. It's showing us that 95% of the part is green or showing a high cooling quality. However, if we run a cool, fill, pack, and warp analysis with our cooling lines in there, you can see now that only 51% of this part is showing a high cooling quality and another 44 percent showing a medium cooling quality. So the cooling quality analysis is a good general comparison tool. However, when you get down to your close to your final design, you may want to run or consider running a cooling analysis with your fill, pack, and warp analysis. Now we'll compare our temperature variance results between these two analysis sequences. So, in this image, the part shown in the top of it, you'll see the cooling quality analysis is showing us temperature variance from negative 6.5 to 7.7 .7 degrees Celsius. Whereas, if we run a full cool, fill, pack, warp analysis, and we're considering those cooling lines, you'll notice the temperature variance is much more significant we're going from negative 17 to 29.3 degrees Celsius on our scale. Now we'll look at comparing our cool time variance results. So if we look at the image on the right, the part shown on the top is where we ran a cooling quality analysis only. You can see the cooling time variance goes from negative 3.4 to 3 on our scale. If we look at the one on the bottom, where we ran a cool, fill, pack, and warp analysis, the cooling time variance is much worse at negative 7.2 to 8.4 on our scale. Now again, I'll mention here as I did on the previous two slides where we compared these results between these modules. The cooling quality analysis is a great preliminary tool. It helps you identify key trends in problematic areas. However, the cool fill pack warp analysis is much more suitable when you get further in your design process. You're giving us more information on your intended design. Therefore, we can give you more accurate information back on what will really happen in reality. So in previous slides, we compared the cooling quality analysis versus cooling. Now, we'll take a closer look at a fill pack warp analysis one where we ran cool and one where we did not. So if we take a look at this image on the right, the part in the upper portion of it is one that we ran a fill, pack, and warp analysis on. So no cool. There are no cooling lines modeled here. So we're assuming ideal cooling in this situation. So you can see if we look at our quality prediction, 99% of this part is predicted as having a high quality. But if we run a cooling analysis with that fill pack warp analysis, you can see that now only 49% of our part 
falls within that high quality prediction range. And another 51% in yellow. Again, you're giving us more information on the final design. So we can give you a more accurate result on what will happen in reality. Now if we take a closer look at this part where we ran a, a fill pack warp analysis with cool and another without cool, you'll see that there's something else that's surprising to reveal. The top four images are where we ran just a fill pack warp analysis. This is indicating that we have one main contributor to our warp. That would be differential shrinkage. However, if we run a cool fill pack warp analysis, you can actually see that there are two contributors to our warpage here. That would be our differential shrinkage as well as our differential cooling. You can see differential cooling now is showing a huge impact on our overall warpage results. So in summary, the cooling quality analysis is a great starting point. It provides us information on hot and cold spots for cooling circuit layout design. So it gives us a good idea where to start when designing our cooling layout. Fill pack warp analysis alone. This is really a compromise. It provides information on all possible deflection considering ideal cooling situations or conditions. This is not the case in reality. So you're really not capturing the whole picture when doing this. But when we run a cool fill pack and warp analysis, this is really recommending. It provides the most information considering all the variables that will be involved. Which analysis sequence assumes ideal cooling? Now that you've had an opportunity to view this presentation, please try the following exercise to further your skills. For additional information on how to access these exercises, please refer to the introduction video. Thank you.